Welcome to jeffwillis.com. Today we've got Gary Birtwistle with us today. Now Gary is a best-selling author. Uh, he operates from a place called The Vault. Yep. Uh, he also has actually uh, raised $6.1 million for cancer, running a charity called Tour de Cure over the last years, I think five years, since mm -hmm. 2007. And uh, does a lot of public speaking gigs and keynotes. So thanks, Gary, for uh, spending the time with us today. It's just That's fabulous right. to have you here. So, Gary, uh, tell me a little bit about yourself and uh, why you're here today in this uh, very uh, fine building called The Vault, which is actually an ex-Commonwealth Bank building, I believe. Is that correct? Yeah, it is. I, um, I started my uh, working career in Brisbane um, back in the day and uh, with a department store chain called Walton's and I loaded and unloaded trucks for a while. Before. Right. It was a very proud day for my dad when I got promoted to the toy department. got to wear a tie. And I went through the whole training managers thing and then I joined shopping centres and worked with Frank Lowe and John Saunders at Westfield for a number of years and I worked in the music industry and then back in the shopping centres. And my last real job was working in radio, so I worked for Australia looking after the promotions and marketing for Australia and right. Malaysia. Yep. And when I left to do my own thing, I, w I started by doing promotions and marketing for people because that was what I knew and it was easy for me for cash flow, but I really wanted to be a, a speaker. So I would go in, I'd do a speaking job for you, and one of the questions people would always ask is, well, where should we do our, our convention, we should do our meeting, we should do our training sessions, and there were no venues around apart from a hotel room, which was, you know, four beige walls, a green tablecloth, some water and a bowl of mints. No vibe. No vibe, no inspiration, <laughs> and I'd take along like a suitcase of toys, right. and people would get off on that and some coloured paper, and I thought there had to be something, what's the next great thing? Yep. So the vault, which is a seven, eight-sided building at Fox Studios, the old, now it's called the Entertainment Quarter at, uh, in Sydney. Um, it was the inspiration to find a venue that would relax people, it was colourful, it had good coffee. And we chose a green couch as well. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And that was the idea of it. So it came from a natural progression of speaking and rather than just speaking at people, wanting them to learn, and then from that, what would be a learning environment and the whole thing's just sort of morphed over the years, made into kind of the vault in my speaking and my writing and everything else. Yeah, it's a great space. Uh, we turned up here and went, wow. So. It facilitates a little bit of, uh, I suppose, creative thinking for you, as well as people that uh, attend here. Well, it does, and that's, that's one of the issues today around the creative thinking, is you think best when you're relaxed. Yep. You drop your shoulders. You know, Da Vinci said there's no room in a busy mind for creativity. So this room is about dropping your shoulders and relaxing, which is why we have, you know, cushions and green, green couches, and there's foosball, and there's games to play, and, you know, good coffee, and... You can sit on a beanbag and stuff because when you chill out and relax, you've got the outdoor grass area, you go outside and sit under a tree to think. That's what's missing in today's corporate world when you're in cubicles and boardrooms where you walk around staring at a crack room. You don't yep. have that relaxation part. So yep. it's kind of more from my learnings about creativity to then say, well, if you're spending a lot of money for an offsite, where should you go? So this kind of has become like the hub for creative thinking in the country, actually, because it's just a unique environment that helps people understand relax and unlock their ideas. Yeah. Now, you're also the author of, uh, I think your best-selling book is Who Stole My Mojo. Yeah. So tell me a little bit about that. I, I love the title. Well, the title, it's funny, when I, when I wrote my first couple of books, I wrote the book and I always used to struggle to know what to call it. Yeah. This one started from the title first and I'd done a job in Washington, D.C., in the States and I was done my stick on stage. I was sitting in the audience watching a guy close the conference. And I was doing Austin Powers impersonations for right. the girl next to me. It's a true story. And we were doing the whole, you know, does this make you horny, does it? And yeah. this sort of stuff, right? Yeah. And what occurred to me was that I was looking around the audience, there's 400 people, whatever. And everyone was exchanging business cards and had journals full of notes and they really had their mojo going. And you just knew that in two weeks' time, all the interaction with the people, those cards they had, the journal would be covered in paperwork, they'd be having dinner from the Bicky can, and all that excitement they took away from Washington, D.C. would be gone. Mm -hmm. They'd be sitting there at 7 o'clock at night having biscuits for dinner going, who stole my mojo? Like, I had it. Well, I, I know I came back with it. Where, where did it go? Yep. And I had all the content bubbling around in my head that I'd had for quite a while. So once I had the title, it was actually pretty easy for me to write because all the stuff was up there and dumped down. Um, and to this day it's gone really good and then I did one for dads like um, my dad's got mojo because I had so many questions from parents saying well 
how does this relate to the mojo thing to parents and kids, everything else? So it morphed into my dad's got mojo, he's the best dad ever. So, and it's funny, the last couple of years, the mojo title has been used a lot more in the media. Mm -hmm. Like when I wrote the book in like 2007, it was Austin Powers famous, but now it's become very media centric stuff. So I think I timed it pretty good. <laughs> so good timing. Yeah. Okay. Um, I know you're doing, we just spoke earlier and you said one of the things you're going to talk, you're actually doing a uh, keynote presentation tomorrow, I believe. And, yeah. Uh, and we, we were talking about social media and, uh, and what was the uh, key thought behind what you're going to talk about for the advertising types, the uh, young 20 and 30 somethings that you're going to be addressing tomorrow? What's, what were you going to tell them? Because actually I found it quite interesting. Well, my belief is, look, I love, I think social media is great, but it's just a promotional tool. It's a, it's a platform to deliver. Exactly. Yep. And the conference tomorrow is about multi-platform. Yep. So everyone's getting caught up in doing it, but there's no thinking behind it. So that's, all, so that's very tactical. Absolutely. It's totally tactical. And one great strategy is worth 100 tactics. Yep. And the problem is they're putting all these buttons on their websites. They're talking about it. But if the things you're doing through Twitter and LinkedIn and Facebook and digging and all this other stuff that these guys are doing, unless it's got a basis to why the hell should I buy your product, yep. it's just promotion. Yep. Where it really works is when you actually use that to promote and reinforce why I should buy from you, yep. your product or service, and you add value to my world and don't waste my time, then it's a wonderful tool. But there's a disjoint for me right now, is that people think just because they've got a Facebook site or they tweet, that's the successful part of marketing and brand, but it ain't. Yep. The people who use it best are the ones that actually have a real message as to why I should buy from you. Then they just use that as a platform to reinforce that and add value to my world. And so that's kind of the core of my message tomorrow. Um, and unless marketers are taking time to, to walk amongst the people who've got the problems, yep. to find out how they can solve those problems, yep. rather than spending their whole time in their crackberries, then they're not using their best available weapons of, of attack. So. so really, essentially, your message is about uh, treat it as a strategic tool, not just tactical, in other words. Absolutely. Work out what you're trying to sell, what's your product about, what are your goals, and who's your yeah. audience. Strategy's okay. missing today. Like, strategy is a part that's missing. Yep. And strategy comes from the Greek word strategios, which means the art of the general. But these kids aren't generals. They're, yep. just, they're just workers. They're just doing stuff. And the problem today is we confuse activity with accomplishment. Yep. If I'm not busy, I'm not getting anything done. Yep. The guy or girl who's a really great marketer is the one who's just walking around looking at stuff and really seeing what's going on or having conversations and listening yep. and really hearing what's being said. Then using those tools to capitalise on that in order, for, in order for that product or service to be able to fix my problem. Yep. Most people can't answer in one single sentence, why should I buy your product? Right. If you can't answer that, all the other stuff ain't going to work. You're just wasting your time and your money. So would you, is the term you use for that unique selling proposition or you use another yeah. term for that? Yeah, you can use, everyone's got their own t term for it. Yeah. I'm a bit more dumbed down than that is why should I buy you? Yep. You know, you've got a blog, yep. a lot of people come to you, they're coming there for a particular reason. They're not coming because you're a good, well you are a good looking guy, don't get me wrong. Yeah. <laughs> no, they're not coming to you just for that, they're coming to you because you fix a problem for them. That's right. And if you're not fixing the problem for them, then why the hell do I need you? There's plenty of blogs I could go to. Yep. And if you're working for an organisation and you're not fixing the problem within the organisation, differently better the person next to you, one of you is redundant. That's right. So that's kind of what the strategic part of it is, which comes back to the art of the general. It's a step back, look at the marketplace, walk around and see what's going on, then think about how you use social media mm. to fix my problems. Yeah. yeah, social media's power certainly comes into the fact you can get messages in real time. Mm. Um, I think Supre does it brilliantly in terms of they do crowdsource market research. Yeah. Do you like this product or that product? The one that gets the most likes is the one they actually manufacture. So that is, you know, fabulous listening. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, Tim Ferriss, best-selling author, of the last two books on New York Times, everything else. I remember when he was writing his last book, he put up all the covers and said, "Which one do you like the best?" It's a no-brainer. Yeah. Really, it's clever. Yeah, one of the reasons I actually started blogging is because of Tim Ferriss, which right. is uh, from a lifestyle magazine yeah, right. point of view, the, the four-hour work week. Yeah, yeah. And someone said to him once that uh, what you're talking about isn't—it's actually not a four-hour work week. And he said, "Well, hang on, it's 
it's more about the concept. It's about a lifestyle choice. Correct. Which I believe that you, know, you live and breathe yourself in terms of uh, your daughter and you want to make sure that you're there to help her Absolutely. rather than working in a corporate world. So, and, and that goes into the other parts of your life as well as trying to help exactly people right, cure right. cancer. Totally agree. Yeah. So, Gary, is there anything else that you want to talk about in terms of your passion about that... Um, before I ask you the, the final question, is there anything else that... Um, like your books, your speaking. Um, is there anything else you'd like to touch on today? Oh no, I think um, the thing that I the thing that I get excited about is when people appreciate how much more talent they've got than they thought they had for whatever reason. Yeah. And my belief is there's just killer killer ideas in boardrooms all over the world as you and I sit here today dying. Yep. Because people haven't got the courage to speak up. They haven't put the time to sit down and think and ponder. They don't believe in their own ability. You know, we've, we've got so much more great talent in each of us. Yep. The job for us through blogs and stuff we do is to help people get confidence to draw those ideas out. Um, and so that's kind of the, the thing that I'm interested in, is getting people to think differently about their brand, being a dad, how we cure cancer, how we be our best, and all those sorts of things. So... That's kind of the stuff that I... I think the doing part is the easy part. I think it's the thinking part that I'm more interested in is actually how people get to unlock their ideas and, and think differently. So that's kind of why I uh, write and speak about it, is to provoke people's thinking to get them to go, OK, that's, uh, that's interesting. You know, how, how, would, how would I apply that to me? Because I just don't want to see people die with the music and I don't want to see people die with their great ideas and that's I, the whole... Yeah, there's many people who go to their grave with their song unsung. Exactly. And uh, I think one of the things you mentioned was to actually is, is to get things out of your head and actually either on paper or online so people actually can learn. Gary, I'm just asking one question I quite often ask people I interview is, what's Gary Birtwistle's secret source? Um, probably my tractor. I bet you haven't had that answer before. <laughs> Tell me more. <laughs> I, um, I... It's in those moments when you disconnect from the world where you sit and ponder mm -hmm. that you find the great juice. And sometimes it doesn't come, but that's all part of the process. Sometimes what comes up is crap. That's part of the process. And for me, I can't stand in front of any audience because I've got guys like yourself who are you know, bright, smart, hard markers. If you stand on stage and talk about disconnecting, thinking, breaking the rules, taking time to dream know what the perfect world looks like. If you're not doing it yourself, they're going to poke a finger at you and say, well, mate, where are you doing it? So I, um, I bought a farm, which in my vision was to have a farm where there were no, no people around. I just wanted a, a river and some cattle that I could just disconnect from. So I spent a lot of my time there, and that is the thing that and I have found that I feel that my speaking and my writing is better because of it. Because when I come back to do a gig, I'm looking forward to it. Like, I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to the jobs as opposed to being another... It ain't a job for me, it's a privilege. Yeah. And I really, when I get off and I'm away from the noise and I get three or four days away from the noise, when I come back to the noise, I'm pleased to be there. So I think the secret for me, or the source for me, is that downtime that I have just in the paddocks with the cattle. And probably the thing that makes that worthwhile is my little girl and my wife. You know, that whole, you know, getting away and having just real time and being really in the moment because there's no distractions. So I think that's what, um, that's kind of what the source is. And I think what makes me different to a lot of other guys is that I think I probably take on that country, that country life thing about, you know, um, when the sun's up, get to work, when the sun goes down, you know, you go inside and spend time with your family and there's no distractions and stuff. And I think it's given me the chance to think better, uh, ponder better, and which in, in turn then allows me to provoke people to help them unlock their good ideas. Yep. And we do it through the Espresso newspaper and through speeches and books and these sorts of things here. So I'd have to say that, you know, getting away from the noise, or as someone said to me recently, turning up the quiet and turning down the noise. Yep. That's kind of, I think, what the source is for me. In other words, have some quiet time for let the thoughts have the space to actually come into. Yeah, and the thing is, if you look at anyone who's successful in anything, you know, really successful, and you actually dig into their world, they all have it. 
you know, Johnny Depp retires to his island or, you know, his, his, his country place in France. Um, da Vinci, Michelangelo were ceaseless wanderers. They just take off, you know, for days at a time and just walk. Um, Branson has his, his, you know, boat in the, nestled up in the countryside. So, I mean, everyone, they've all got this quiet place to go to to get away from the noise. Yep. The problem today is that we're so busy, it's all noise. We wake up in the, in the morning, the first thing we do is grab our mobile phones and check our messages. And it doesn't stop then until we crash out. It's the last thing we do before we go to bed is do anything. And there's just no, there's no silence in that. You know, and Ben Kingsley won the Oscar for uh, Gandhi, and he was interviewed on television. They said, you know, what's the secret of success? And he said, silence and stillness are my currency. And that really resonated with me. And when you actually study a lot of these people, like the great professors and doctors and community people and artists and musos and actors, they all did that silence. It's that time to stop and think. But when you're always busy, your brain doesn't get a chance to think. So I, I've kind of taken that quite seriously and, and done it with the view that I'm also a mirror for my little girl. Right. Yep. And what she sees, she's going to mimic. So if I'm leading by example, hopefully she'll pick up on that at her young age and it'll be something she'll carry through because um, it's a powerful tool to be able to sit and think. Yep. Well, thanks very much for sharing your secret sauce, Gary. <laughs> and uh, quiet time on a tractor, I think, is the go. <laughs> yeah. Thank you very much. And Cheers, this mate. is Jeff at jeffbullis.com with Gary Burtwistle. Thank you, Gary. Cheers, mate.